We are all set. Thank you very much. We are all set. Appreciate it. Um, to answer your question, Senator Armar, I was planning on as we move into this next phase. Um, if everyone could please consider the fact that we have people who've been waiting a very long time. We only have a few more hours left and I wanna to get to as many people as possible. So I'd really like the indulgence of the committee to only ask questions, not make commentary and try to keep your questions as brief and direct as possible so that we can get to as many people as we possibly can for the time we have left. So I, I very much appreciate that, thank you. Um, is, is Mr. Volmar on? I know you've been there, Mr. Volmar, Bill Volmar. I've tried a couple of times, so I'll try one more time. You're on mute. If you can take yourself off mute. Okay, we're gonna move on then uh, to number 380, Nolan Flynn. Hi. Um, he's sleeping. I don't know if I could take his number and switch to 386. You're I'm 386 and he's 380. Okay. We're going to be there in a minute. So go right ahead. Okay. Hang on. You really can't switch numbers, but you're so close. Uh, that's what I figured. Hang on. My, okay. Go right ahead. Um, my name is my name is Jacqueline Flynn. I live in Naugatuck, Connecticut. Um, this is probably my fifth time trying to testify and I've only got to do it once. So I've been in this a long time, but I'm still a newbie and I'm blind because I'm sleeping right now and I can't read my paper. So bear with me. Um, so do we really have a choice? They tell us we do, but for the past few years, it has been hard to feel that way, especially when our elected officials tell us outright that our voice doesn't matter, that their minds are made up. And I've had legislators just say that right, right to me, people that are on this panel. It is discouraging to say the least. For the past two years, I have felt unheard, slandered, demeaned, scapegoated, and de decriminated against my deeply held beliefs about the health of my children. Silencing different points of views is un-American to me. The strange part is that it is mostly a partisan theme. I always was a Democrat until the party betrayed me. The ideals of the Democratic Party no longer support nor align with body autonomy and religious freedom. It is sad that ulterior motives and conflicts of interest have blinded the party that championed a woman's choice and body. I want my children to testify and have their voice heard, but I feel bad giving them false hope that they will be that you will be listening to them or any of us it feels futile and patronizing to us it is how you want the future of, is this how you want the future of american america to feel political apathy needs to change and this is not the way to engage the public and future generations we want to feel heard acknowledged and respected for our individual beliefs and i've seen people um, you know say to kids right here on this zoom Thank you for testifying. You did great. Keep doing it. And they're going to say, why? When you just voted, you just totally ignored anything that we all said. Being called an anti-vaxxer for years to discredit those of us who question what we put into our children's bodies has caused so much divisiveness, discrimination, marginalization, and downright hate. It is a politically incorrect, is it polit it is politically incorrect to marginalize any group, except when the media deems it acceptable. This whole process exudes extreme hypocrisy and our representatives protest that they champion children, education, equality, kindness, et cetera, while the opposite feels tr true. The process feels rigged. Our voices and ideas are being silenced, all for a vested interest perhaps. These derogatory labels twist the reality of how I run my life as a mother, a chiropractor, a person, and how my children and I are viewed in the community. And just to reiterate on this, one of our senators posted on Twitter a very derogatory comment just in the middle of this hearing calling anti-vaxxers associated with QAnon. I mean, some ridiculousness. And just the fact that that is allowed in our legislator is just totally behooves me. And I can't imagine that um, action wouldn't be taken 
um, against this particular senator. It's very demeaning. Kicking our children out of school, causing many to uproot their Ms. lives Ms. and families out of state. Um, in Ms. search Ms. of religious freedom like has, and a free conclude. public education. Okay, sorry. Um, if you pass this, um, I've been talking to my daughter about getting her GED as she's 17 and has one more year left in high school. And we're searching for careers that she wouldn't have to go to college and we wouldn't have to um, you know, flee for religious freedom. As for my son, he has four years of high school. I have no idea what we're gonna do with him as he just got into a new program and he plays hockey and it's just disheartening. We just, the, the, there's no answer to kick all these kids out of school. It's just un-American. And I just obviously vehemently oppose um, both these bills, HB 6423 and SB 568. Thank you for your time. Thank you, ma'am. And um, thank you for being here in this early morning hour with us, uh, Senator Summers. Yes, um, thank you for being here. And I'm gonna keep my question quick, but I'd like to for you to explain to the people that are here or share with us how it makes you feel when you're in the middle of a hearing and you see that kind of rhetoric by somebody who's supposed to be listening to this hearing. I mean, it's just so concerning. It's just, I can't even explain it. I wrote this, a whole editorial about, this whole slanderous word and how they've just demeaned us in so many ways. And we're in a society, you can't call anyone anything. I mean, you can't uh, talk about anyone's race, religion, sexual orientation, disability, nothing. I mean, you are, you are, you know, hate crime for it up and down. And for some reason calling the intelligent, you know, people that just care about their health, anti-vaxxers and just, making it have this, this horrible slur that we are like dregs of society. It's just, I, I just don't even understand how the, the, the legislature accepts it, the media accepts it. I mean, the media perpetuates it, of course, but I just find it really concerning. And for myself, my family, all of us that have been in this movement and been so passionate and we're as you can see, I mean, people are educated. This isn't like fringe society of, of people here. This is people that care deeply about science, about their health, about keeping their kids in school and, and valuing education. I'm sorry that you've had to uh, see that while you're testifying. And I'm sorry for people that have uh, come here tonight and spent nearly 24 hours with us tonight. Um, to have to see that kind of rhetoric up. Um, it, I think it's, it's not, not okay. And um, I, I, I don't wanna speak for everybody, but I've respected everybody who has come here regardless of other viewpoints. And I'm here to listen to the clinicians and to the people that will be impacted by this bill. So I appreciate you being here and- um, Thank you. Thank you for <laughs> that information. I appreciate it. Thank you, Representative Beth. Representative Betts, your hand's up, but you're on mute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, I can, go right ahead. Thank you very much. I just wanna make a request to the chairs and the leadership of this committee because I believe we're all in agreement with this. If there's somebody posting or doing things that is slanderous or demeaning to people who are making comments in this public hearing, uh, I think they need to be called out and, and told that this is not the way we communicate and respect people. And I don't want to go into it now, but if what this lady has just said is true, then some people need to be held, held accountable and apologize because this is not the way we communicate and conduct business. So I asked the chairs to look into this. And if in fact, what she said is true, uh, I really would expect a strong statement coming uh, on behalf of the committee from the chairs. Thank you very much. Thank you. I don't see any more questions, so thank you for being with us this morning. I just want to thank everybody um, for, for being there, the people that were, because there were many that weren't engaged in this at all, and that's also very upsetting and concerning. So thank you for those that thank you. Did, did bear with us. Thank you. Um, next is Alex Campbell. Alex, go right ahead. 
Can you hear me? Can you see me? Awesome. Yeah. Is this oh, this moment of right truth ahead. where you figure out where I'm, whether I'm Mets fan or a Yankees fan, am I going to be on your side or am I going to be on the other side? Yeah, that's what it is. Because you know what? This has been the most depressing 24 hours I've ever really watched because I already know what the outcome is. You know, why I know the outcome because I've already experienced, I've already taught in California. I've taught in Virginia. I'm teaching in New York state. I've been kicked out of New York state. My kids have been kicked out of school. And guess what? Now, since my name is up here and I'm publicly appearing in front of you all, I'm going to be kicked out of my job. And I know you're thinking like, how could that happen? A public school teacher being kicked out of their job because I was basically told not to talk about my beliefs. And because my kids aren't vaccinated and, oh, I'm not either. I'm one of those teachers that's spreading everything to my students. And I've been teaching for 25 years and I've had 6,300 students. And guess what? None of them have ever gotten sick and I've never gotten sick from them. But that doesn't matter because the narrative that you're following or the majority of that you are following, it doesn't matter what I say. So now I've ousted myself. I've ousted my children. I'm going to get fired. I'm going to lose my pension. And you know what? The reality is that 8,400 kids in Connecticut, which I've moved to, are now going to get, you know, the bad end of the stick. Why are they going to get that bad end of the stick? Because you, you have made this partisan, right? You have made this politically driven the moment you didn't accept the two truths that you know to be true, which are there's no evidence that unvaxxed children cause disease. And two, the most important, which you have done for public health already. Yes, you guys have made it sure that if there is an outbreak on the religious exemption, it specifically says you have to stay out of school until this passes, the outbreak passes. So you've done it. Good job. Well done. You did your job. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you for doing that because it will keep the problem out. So when, why do we have to stay out? Um, then there must be another reason like, oh, that seventh through 12th grade thing. I mean, talking about a plan that's granted exclusively, it's just absurd. It shows discriminatory and unscientific practices. I mean, it's arbitrary and an a logical demarcation. It shows a political and financial driven writing because we all know that sixth graders get the majority of vaccines. So now when I have a kid who is a sixth grader and an eighth grader, both in middle school, in the same school, they're now going to have to, what, they're in classrooms right across from each other, but the sixth grader is not going to be able to go. What are you going to do about families about that? So the reality is, is that you have done your job actually quite well. You made sure that the religious exemption works until it doesn't need to because, well, people have to somehow, you know, get kicked out because of or temporarily kicked out because of the, you know, something going wrong with their, um, you know, vaccines or something. But what I'm trying to say is that you guys now have, let me get my train of thought going, because I do have to go to work and get kids in and all of those things. Oh, well, Excuse while I have me, my job. Your three minutes. My three if minutes like are up. Okay. I appreciate it. Well, Thank I appreciate you. you giving me three minutes to speak. But know that as a teacher, I see every student who's ever had a problem or an issue, I can tell you anything about kids not having or having difficulty with whatever teaching it is. But I know that you've already made your minds up and I feel sorry for those 8,400. You should do it like Switzerland does, which is everybody gets a little pamphlet and knows about it. You'd have a lot more people, maybe even on your side and to educate if you actually let the entire 3 million people in the state know this major decision that you're making. Thank you for letting me speak. Sorry, I won't have a job for Thank much you. longer. I hope that's not true. Thank you it very much true, for actually. being here this morning. Thank um, you. I appreciate your time. I don't see any questions, so we'll move on to Krista Lestrina Matthews. Krista, I see you there, but you're on mute. You can unmute yourself. Thank you. Go right ahead. Hi, can you hear me? I can go right ahead. Oh, I can see okay. you now too. All right, wonderful. Oh, Christina, I spoke too soon. You're bre I'm sorry, Krista. I'm sorry. I spoke too soon. You're breaking up and eliminating that. Excuse I'm sorry. Me? You were breaking up, at least for me. Could you start again, please? I can. Strina Matthews, I'm here in the strongest position. 
You're still, you're still breaking up for me. I value my right to religious freedom as you're okay. still breaking up. Is there I'm a different way to connect? I'm going to try that. Let's see. Okay. Now I heard that perfectly. Is that any better? For this me, is better? Still, yeah, try that. Go right ahead. Okay. Let's give it another whirl. 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 Now it's echoing. Any better? Yes, that's very oh. good. Thank you. Great. My name is Crystal Estrina Matthews, and I'm here in the strongest opposition to eliminate religious exemption. To those who support eliminating religious exemption. As a free citizen of the United States and Connecticut, I value my right to religious freedom as much as you do, and your proposal directly attacks my religious freedom. You and I have both been blessed to be citizens of the US and you and I share the right to express our religious freedom in any way we choose. This is the basis on which the US was founded and remains one of the most valuable rights we possess. As you attack my religious freedom, Will you also demand a woman whose religion is expressed by wearing a head covering that she is no longer allowed to do so? Shall we tell people who don't eat certain foods due to religious beliefs that they must now eat those foods they refuse? You and I both know the answer to that is no. It would be unthinkable, heinous, and would rain down a fury from those being persecuted and those who stand against such injustice. Your current efforts to take away my religious freedoms is no different and thinking so is pure discrimination. This is that fury raining down right now. The free citizens I stand with will not stop fighting for our rights and the rights of our children. I ask that you consider your own faith in whatever form of faith you freely choose and consider the habits and traditions you hold dear in your faith and consider how you would feel if it were now illegal to practice those traditions. Thousands of families in Connecticut are now being persecuted because of your proposed bill. According to our constitutional rights, which you are proposing is most definitely illegal. Should your illegal bill be passed, you will have discriminated against thousands of children whose parents simply choose a different path of faith than you do. The children you are discriminating against will be ostracized from their peers. And for those whose families are not wealthy, a good majority, you will be responsible for denying them a proper education and foundation for life. Often those who propose vaccine related mandates are viewed as out there lunatics who just need to get on board with what others just so happen to believe. We are viewed as uneducated troublemakers and our opinions and beliefs are treated as second class. Not the case. I earned a Bachelor of Science from UConn and now own my own successful small business, something I've worked extremely hard for. With that, I've made the very well researched and educated decision to not vaccinate my children or myself. My decision is based on both science and religious faith. Science in that there are documented unpredictable dangers in vaccines and religious faith in that I will never inject my child with aborted fetal cells. And that is my faith, faith, that is my religious freedom. As you exercise your religious freedoms without a second thought, why are you targeting my religious freedom? How am I so different? And what about my religious faith is so offensive to you that you feel the need to discriminate against me? As I leave you alone to practice your religious freedom in any manner you freely choose, I ask that you give me the same courtesy. Do not infringe on my religious freedoms so that if yours are ever threatened as you are currently threatening mine, you will have others on your side to stand with you and fight for your own. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Matthews. I don't see any questions, so I'm gonna thank you for your time this morning for being with us. And we're going to move on to Lisa Ruby. Lisa, I see you there. If you can unmute yourself. Go right ahead. Good morning. My name is Lisa Ruby. Can you hear me? I can. Go right ahead. Okay. My name is Lisa Ruby. I'm a Christian military wife and special needs mom. I oppose SB 568 and HB 6423. Removal of the religious exemption is not only discriminatory for obvious reasons regarding freedom of religion, but the cascading effect causes more prejudiced inequity. 
My first point is military families. If my husband has orders to Connecticut and we arrive with school age children who have all had religious exemptions in other states, will they be required to receive all their missing vaccines to attend Connecticut schools for just two, two years? If they are denied an education, I could choose to take my kids out of state away from my active duty husband who already has sacrificed years away from his children. This religious exemption removal would most certainly hurt military children. So what about homeschooling? Homeschooling is not an option for many families. Others have pointed out how it discriminates against some families, but I want to focus on special needs. Last spring, I was forced to quarantine school, my 19-year-old with special needs because of the COVID shutdowns. He attended an excellent transition work program with highly skilled teachers, work coaches, and paraprofessionals. He had jobs out in the community. How does a parent teach a community work program when there's no community and no worker opportunities? State disability services. If my disabled child is not in school because his religious exemption was not honored, he is not eligible for services from Connecticut's Department of Developmental Services. My son is expected to stay in the school program until he ages out at 22. Then his adult state services will kick in. Medical exemption. Medical exemptions are extremely difficult to get because physicians' hands are tied by the state. It should be the child's doctor that determines whether he needs a medical exemption or not. My son does have a 16-year-old medical exemption from California. Since then, no doctor in four other states has been willing to write one for fear of reprisal from the medical board. They recommend he use the religious exemption instead. Religious exemption does not mean unvaccinated. All of my children have had have a re religious exemption and have received vaccines. You do not have the data to make a blanket statement that certain schools have low vaccination rates for certain infections. Your opinion. It is irrelevant that you may believe my religious beliefs are insincere or not valid. Yes. I am protected by the Constitution. It is irrelevant that you may believe vaccines are safe and effective. Perhaps your infant did not have a grand mal seizure, choke on the foam in his mouth, and stop breathing while you were driving home from the pediatrician. Consensus of opinion is not science. Belief is a faith-based argument, not science. Thank you for your time today. It's been a long day and your service to our state. I pray for your wisdom and understanding in this matter affecting people of all health, races, abilities, and religions in this state. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rupi, for being here this morning to share your perspective with us. I really appreciate it. I don't see any questions, so I'm going to move on to Melissa Pergola. Melissa, if you're here, that your number 388, followed by- Hi. 390 James Smith. Thank you. Go ahead, Melissa. Is that, is that, can you hear me okay? I can, go right ahead. Hi, I can see morning. you and hear you. I'm Melissa Pergola. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> I'm Melissa Pergola. Um, I am very much opposed to HB 6423 and SB 568. Um, I actually just am back in Connecticut a little under two years now. I did live in New York prior to coming back to Connecticut and I saw what actually taking the religious exemption did to the children in New York. Um, there were over 26,000 children who were kicked out of school for simply the reason that they didn't have every vaccine or they didn't have any vaccines at all. Um, it did not improve any outbreak rates. It did not improve any health. Um, there was plenty of articles afterwards and I knew a lot of moms, I was in Long Island, that um, there were still chicken pox outbreaks, there were still measles outbreaks, there were still pretty much most of the vaccine preventable disease outbreaks in those schools. Um, there's no study or evidence to prove that the under vaccinated children pose a public health threat. Um, I found an article that I thought was very interesting about immunity and what vaccines actually do. The health of our current children right now is, I don't know too many children who have had the full schedule of vaccines that are actually truly optimal health, don't have ear infections, don't have an asthma inhaler to use, food allergies, ADD, ADHD, um, obviously autism, and it's nothing like it was 100 years ago if you look at children. They might've had other you know, illness from hygiene, things like that, but not what's happening now. Um, I found this really interesting article and hopefully I'll have a few 
minutes to, um, hold on, to read it. Um, the hallmark of vaccination is that it bypasses the cell mediated response in favor of a mock infection while encouraging a disproportionate humoral response. According to an elegant new book by Dr. Thomas Cowan, the reckless suppression of the cell mediated response is a very bad idea. Interfering with such a precise immune response, the result of millions of years of evolutionary fine tuning carries with it a massive risk of unintended consequences. And those consequences are now manifesting in the form of an autoimmunity crisis. I'm sure you guys can all ask any neighbor, any friend, any family member if they have an autoimmune disease. I know what autoimmune disease is myself because I actually had four of them um, over 20 years ago and I've healed them on my own with nutrition and with health, not with um, pharmaceutical drugs. Those just basically broke apart my body and made me even sicker. I've seen that with my own children who both unfortunately did have vaccine reactions. One was a massive seizure and the other was not being able to walk for quite a few days after um, the DTaP vaccine. I have a 14 and 11 year old. Um, after that, I did lots of research. So that's why this article really felt close to me. Um, the problem with the vaccines as well is that there's, you're actually forfeiting protections. Immunologic dysregulation, including dysfunction of the type brought about by vaccination, is associated not just with autoimmunity, but also with cancer. And childhood cancers are skyrocketing. So I want to kind of go back to that UConn student who was saying she sees lots of immunocompromised children, premature births. And the amount of cancer in children is, to me, completely unacceptable. Children should be the most robust and healthy of our of our entire generation. You think of a five-year-old or a two-year-old or a 12-year-old, they should not have all this illness now. Um, so I do feel that the vaccines are part of it. Um, one of the things that I thought was pretty interesting here was naturally acquired mumps engendered immunity to ovarian cancer through antibodies against the cancer-associated antigen. Individuals who experience fever-inducing infectious Bella? illness in childhood, such Ms. as Bella, rebellion. You've reached three minutes if you'd like to conclude. Okay. Um, Children who successfully go through measles have less heart disease, arthritis, allergies, autoimmune diseases, and overall better health than those who never get measles. Pretty much most of our grandparents um, had measles, had mumps, had rubella. They, they all survived it for the most part. Anyone could obviously die of anything. But right now, I believe we're trading acute illness for chronic disease, and it's not acceptable. If you take away the realistic exemption, you're taking away healthy children from the school that they love. My kids have already been in schools in New York, they were actually kicked out, put in the hallway, and I do not want them to go through that again. It was very stressful. As a single mom, I can't afford to homeschool and be home. I have to work full time. So please, please do not take away the religious exemption for my children and please let them stay in school. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here this morning and for testifying. Thank you. Um, I don't see any questions for you, so I hope you have a really lovely day. Thank you. Um, next is James Sneed, followed by Diane Wilson. Mr. Sneed. Hello. Hi, go right ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm his wife. Uh, can I speak on his behalf? Sure, go right ahead. Thank you. I'm here to oppose bills SB 568 and HB 6423. Uh, me and my husband live in New Canaan, Connecticut, uh, with two healthy boys. Uh, I am with my children since day one, and I know them the best. If you can't personally guarantee me that you are going to take care of my children when they are sick, I believe that I have a right voice in raising my children, including any medical treatments, especially vaccinations. I'm a strong supporter for parental rights and ability to practice my beliefs and choices. So please vote no to HB 6423 and SB 568. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. I don't see any questions, so I'll just wish you a wonderful day today. Thank you. You too. Um, next, we have Diane Wilson. You're on mute. Can you hear me now? I can't go right ahead. Uh, it's been a long day, <laughs> night. Uh, my name is Diane Wilson. Um, I, my family and I oppose any and all forms of HB 6423 and SB 568. I apologize, I was on the phone and then my husband got his computer going. I have two children in the public school system and a 10 month old baby. Um, I never thought that my children's religious status would be the way that they learned about seg segregation and discrimination. Um, I thought that would come from 
you know, us raising our family as a Jewish family, but instead it's come from the stress and turmoil they thought, thought last year when they were going to get kicked out of school and again this year. And if this, these bills pass, um, our family will leave the state because my sons enjoy being around children and they enjoy sports. So playing a sports is a, a, an important part of their lives and something that is, it's great to move your body and be around. I also am a, um, I'm just gonna do talking points cause I'm so tired at this point. My younger son who's in sixth grade has an IEP for dyslexia. He has received special services five days a week since second grade. My heart breaks for children who have IEPs that would be affected by this bill. Um, I've heard a representative state that her son also has dyslexia or her child also has dyslexia. Um, children with dyslexia need specialized instruction to learn how to read. And the studies and the statistics out there show that when children do not learn to read at great, at, do not learn to read at, severely affects the rest of their life. So this bill would affect children in elementary school that are re receiving services for special education, dyslexia, the list goes on and on. And none of that has been taken into account. Um, another talking point is Dr. Ross was on yesterday at some point, and he stated that there is no emergency. I've heard members of this panel state that we have to be proactive and ahead of everything. There are a hundred viruses out in the world today. We cannot be, you can try to put yourself in a bubble to protect yourself from every virus out there, but kids are gonna get sick and things are gonna happen. Um, if I know, knew then what I know now, that when my now eighth grader was in second grade, he developed pertussis. We got a call from the Department of Public Health and they said, oh, your child is the first unvaccinated child to get pertussis. Every other kid that's gotten it this year has been fully vaccinated. So what the school did was they had my child stay home and they were very nice about it. And they sent out a letter to the parents and they said that we've had a confirmed case of pertussis because I can tell you when we went to the pediatrician, she was like, oh, we never see this because nobody ever comes in because they, they're quote unquote safe from the vaccination. Um, so the schools do know how to deal with outbreaks. They deal with outbreaks of diarrhea. They deal with outbreaks of the flu. They have to close down sometimes. It's, they can handle it. Um, my, Wilson, my other talking point you've is reached your three minutes if you'd like to conclude. Okay. My other, my last talking point then is the most important, I guess, because not the most important, but, um, representative cook brought up that, um, she's surprised that people are getting kicked out of, um, pediatricians offices. I would suggest that you start in your own backyard because I know of families that have been kicked out of pediatrician's office and my pediatrician off office has threatened to kick us out. So they are in Torrington and I suggest you do your homework in your ho own town. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, Representative Bupkis. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Good morning. Um, I just have one question I just wanna verify what you said, because I'm not sure that I heard you correctly. Um, you said that your child uh, not being vaccinated, but kids that were vaccinated had percussions, right? That's and correct. It was, you know, this happened when my now eighth grader was in second grade. So we, when you get a quote unquote vaccine preventable virus, the, the Department of Public Health calls you and they say, they tell you everything. And the woman was very nice, but she said, your child is the first unvaccinated child to get this, to get pertussis this year because it tends to be cyclic. And she said, every other child that has had it has had been vaccinated. So it's not like my child grows pertussis in his body. Somebody else gave him pertussis. Yeah, I guess my question would be is, it did they make your child go home, but did they make the vaccinated kids go home? They didn't know of any, because, you know, because I think what you will find of the mothers in this group is that we are very in tune to our children. They are our pride and joy. So I knew when I heard that cough, that was a different cough than a normal cough. So I'm like, something is weird with his cough. And I took him to the pediatrician who was nice to us at the time. And I said, it's a different cough. There's something wrong with this cough. Um, and she did, she's like, well, let me check. And I, I explained to her what we were seeing and what he was doing. And she did the swab right in the office. And she's like, actually he has pertussis. And she told me the steps that were gonna happen. She was very nice at the time. 
And the school was very nice to work with and they did all the steps. And they sent home a letter just to, to alert the community that, that a child had tested positive for pertussis. And they said, you know what, stay home and when he feels better, come back. You know, we, I took my, my second grader, I had a kindergartner at the time, we all stayed home, nobody else in the house or we were asymptomatic, ended up with pertussis. Um, but I forget what I was saying. I've lost my train know, of thought. It's <laughs> long and, and we will, we do know our kids. I have two of my own, but I was just curious if, if your kid had to go home because he was not vaccinated while others stayed. They, they didn't, they said my kindergartner could go to school, but I was like, you know what, we're going to play it safe because okay. again, when my children have been sick, I keep them home. Right. So I always go over the 10 day, um, we get the letter every year, like your kids have been out for 10 days, but when they're, when they're not feeling well, I keep them home. They rest. Right. right. Thank you. Thank you for staying all night. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Representative Cook. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And thank you, Diane, for your testimony. I actually have done my homework. Um, I said that I was surprised in last yeah. year's public hearing um, that pediatricians offices were kicking out their patients. I'm very well aware of the offices that are kicking out their patients. I've said numerous times on this forum and last year that it frustrates me immensely and that part of our legislation really needs to be a bridge to figure out a way to make that not happen. I've talked to the chairs about that. Representative Steinberg and I have had that conversation that that is unacceptable and we must figure out a way to bridge the gap of why they are kicking um, patients out and how we can get patients back in and what is the medium between that. So I'm very well aware, I do do my homework. Yes, it is actually my children's pediatrician's office is one of them. Um, I would have never known that because I have all of my children vaccinated. Um, yes, my youngest son does have dyslexia um, and the school itself, he was in school every day and it took them three and a half years and they still never diagnosed it. It was the pediatrician's office that diagnosed it. So, I mean, there's a lot that each one of our families deal with that the other family doesn't understand. Um, I think that I've heard Representative Betts say that numerous times, that everybody needs to put themselves in somebody else's shoes. Um, but I do wanna take pause with the fact that, that somebody would insinuate that we don't do our homework as we sit here, because we definitely do. And I think that that's why we are sitting here for 24 hours trying to figure out how we can um, hear all sides, all parties and rectify issues to make things move in a better in a better way, whether one group thinks it's okay or one group thinks it's not. Um, but I hear you. Um, I thank you for being one of those parents that keep your children home because there are numerous parents that can't or won't. Um, and then that causes a lot of problems as well because if we're forced to send our kids to school um, because we need to go to work or we feel that they need to be in school for a variety of other reasons, that also causes great problems. Um, you know, I just wish everybody would keep their children home if they were ill. I just know that other people don't have that opportunity, um, Representative but Cook, thank I'm you gonna, for your, okay. I was just going to say thank you for your testimony and for being here. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I was just going to say, we, uh, we were talking previously about the fact that we want to just try to stick to questions for the next few hours so that we can make sure we get as many people in as possible. So thank you for that. Um, I don't see any other hands raised, so thank you for being here, Ms. Wilson, and for um, giving us your perspective this morning. Thank you. Um, next, we have Eva Jimenez. Good morning. Good morning. I urge you, I urge you to oppose bills SB 568 and HB 6423. These bills go against American ideals and will impose hardship on my family. Passing either of these bills would kick my two healthy boys out of school and would prevent any of my future children, grandchildren, or even my husband or myself from pursuing any public or private education in the future. My husband, who has low proficiency in English and a GED level education with limited income potential, would be the one who would be forced to quit his job to stay home to homeschool my boys, who would lose their entitled English language learner services. While I, the certified teacher, ironically, would continue to educate other people's children at the expense of my own children's education, just to put food on the table. If this does not work out, we will be forced to leave the state. I will take my shortage area teacher certificates, which are hard to find, and credentials with me. My children will reach their potential elsewhere instead of putting down roots in the state. Ironically enough, my parents immigrated to this state to avoid this same thing that happened to my father. Um, they 
uh, immigrated here 45, 44 years ago to escape communist Poland, where my father's hard earned engineering diploma was denied him and held hostage unless he agreed to join the Communist Party. Just as my father refused to comply with state sponsored coercion tactics, so will we. We will not go against our sincere religious beliefs. My family and I stand firm in avoiding any man made substance that is not in line with God's natural law. Our choices have led to health and happiness and are supported by many licensed integrative and holistic health professionals in the state. We are able to avoid sick visits and have near perfect attendance records at school at work. At the same time, we respect other people's choices and do not impose our religious beliefs and healthy lifestyles on them. We implore you to respect our choice as well. Um, if I had time, I would speak about the whole homeschooling, um, how it's not for everyone, but I think plenty of people touched on that today, so I'll skip that. We can agree that protecting public health is important. I don't deny the risks of contracting illnesses or the benefits of vaccines. My questions for you are, at what cost do we protect public health? Do the ends justify the means? Do the benefits of one size fits all health solutions outweigh their risks? Is a one-sided solution for public health more important than the fundamental rights to religion and education? What are some ways we can truly improve and protect public health without throwing our God-given freedoms away? I believe we can be proactive. I hear this throughout, you know, all our physicians today testified about being proactive. I think we can be proactive for public health in ways that do not trample our rights. Taking away rights should be a last recourse in, a, in the case of an emergency. But yes, we should be proactive. How? Are the experts always right? Do you acknowledge a diversity of scientific perspectives or are you inclined to defer to the assumed expertise and authority of a pharmacentric medical community? The modern medical establishment was fa has failed us many times. Do we blindly trust that the same industry responsible for once promoting smoking, Vioxx and opioids is safe has our best interests in mind? How many talented, Ms. healthy, God-fearing- Ms. Jimenez, you've reached your three minutes if you'd like to conclude. So is there no place for us in the state? Will you let the majority to discriminate against a minority? Public health should not depend on forced consumption and worship of liability-free vaccines. I urge you to respect the diversity of religious beliefs and medical solutions in the state. Vote no on these two bills. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony this morning, for being with us. I don't see any questions, so I'm going to move on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next is Dawson Birdie. Hi, Dawson's my daughter and she asked me to read for her. Okay. My name is Dawson. I love school. I like to play with my friends. My favorite colors are pink and purple. I love to eat lunch at school and I love art class. Let's keep kids in school. And she'd like to give the rest of her time to her brother, Jackson, who would also like me to read for him. My name is Jackson. I oppose SB 568 and HB 6423. If this bill passes, many kids will be kicked out of school. Why would you want to kick kids out? Kids like me love school. I love to play with my friends on the playground. My favorite class is gym. I also love to sing. I want everyone to be able to stay in school. At school, we like everyone and don't want to make others' kids feel left out. In school, I learned that God makes us perfect just the way we are. When I grow up, I want to be Spider-Man and help people. I will help all people, whether they are vaccinated or not. I'm a friend to everyone. If you pass this bill, it will keep my friends apart. Don't do that to us. I love my grandma, grandpa, and cousins. If this bill passes, I will not be able to live near them. I love my family and love playing with my cousins. Vote no on these bills. I want to live near my family and I want to be the greatest Spider-Man in Connecticut. Thank you for that, Dawson. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. I don't see any questions, so I, I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you for being here. Um, next is Peter Waco. Waco, can you hear me? I can. I'm sorry I mispronounced your name. Could you say it again, please? Waco, Long I. Thank you. Thank you. 
Dear members of the Public Health Committee, please oppose SB 568 and HB 6423. Preserve religious freedom, parental rights, education rights, and diverse and health diverse health practices in the state. Um, with that, I would like to also add, it is not the duty of the government to um, decide to, to take our rights. I am not saying this from a perspective regarding vaccines, but that's what's on the chopping block right now. Um, our ability to choose how we handle our own health is our choice. We do not delegate that right to the government. And so that's, that's very wrong, that's very alarming. It has nothing to do with whether or not people take vaccines. That is a right that you don't trample on no matter what's going on. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Appreciate you being here this morning. I don't see any questions, so I'm just going to ask, have a nice day. Um, next up is Walid Yosef. Walid here. Okay, Maria Wojla. I know I did not say that correctly, so please uh -oh. tell us. Hi, that's okay, hello. Hi, my name is Christine Maria and I oppose HB 6423 and SB 568. My children are currently education refugees who attend private school in Connecticut. I'd like to talk a little bit about religion and religious beliefs. It's a common misconception that religion has to do with God or gods, supernatural beings or greater reality. None of that is absolutely necessary because there are religions that are without these elements. Some of these religions have no belief in a God. Some believe in more than one God. What do they have that makes them religion? According to Frederick Ferre in his work, Basic Modern Philosophy of Religion, religion is the most comprehensive and intensive manner of valuing known to human beings. Religious scholar Reza Aslan describes religion and religion belief, religious beliefs as such. Faith is personal and mysterious and individualistic. Religion is merely the language made up of symbols and metaphors that one can use to express one's faith. No one can prove or disprove a person's belief any more than anyone can prove or disprove love. After all, if there is a God, then that God is utterly beyond human comprehension. Do you believe that you are qualified to judge another's religious beliefs? If you pass these bills, you will cause grievous harm to children. My, ch my children, along with 26,000 New York children, were thrown out of school after the repeal of the religious exemption. They've experienced tremendous harm, and we've, tre we've experienced that tremendous harm firsthand. Please feel free to ask me about our experience. With respect to vaccine injury payments, a trust fund was established for awards financed by an excise tax of 75 cents on every vaccine administered. The pharmaceutical companies do not pay for injuries. With respect to physician knowledge about vaccination, I'd urge you to watch Heidi Larson of the Vaccine Confidence Project speech during the UN's Vaccine Safety Summit in 2019. In that speech, she states that doctors receive little education on vaccines in medical school. With respect to comments about restrictions on religious liberties, compelling a baker to make a cake for a gay couple does not equate to a child who is compe compelled to receive a risky vaccination. Baking a cake cannot kill or maim the baker. We have heard a lot about primary and secondary vaccine failure. What I haven't heard is what your plan is to protect the immunocompromised from students who have no immunity due to primary and secondary uh, excuse me, vaccine failure. What is your plan to address that? And finally, I'd like to close with a challenge. We often hear that severe injury or death from vaccines are one in a million. On average, there are 4,000 US children born each year. That means that every year, four children will be sever severely harmed or will die from vaccines. I challenge anyone who votes yes to say it out loud. Say that you are okay with, manda with mandating injury or death to four children every year. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for being here this morning. Appreciate hearing your perspective. Thank you. I don't see any questions, so have a good day. Thank you, you too. 
Um, next up is Ms. Rodriguez. Hello, good morning. Um, I'm actually speaking on behalf of my son, Simon Rodriguez. Is it still okay? Go right ahead. Thank you. My name is Jesse Gleason, and I would like to strongly oppose today the bills HB 6423 and SB 568. Here is what the passing of these bills would mean for me and my family. We would be forced to flee the state of Connecticut in search of a state that will respect our religious beliefs. We do not wish to become religious refugees. We do not wish to gather up our home and our life and start again. This is what 20,000 children and their families in New York had to do two years ago when New York passed a similar bill. Many of them settled in Connecticut and the same thing will happen in Connecticut if this bill is passed. There will be a mass exodus of families who know that injecting their children with the ever growing laundry list of vaccines on the CDC schedule will put their children in harm's way. So separate is not equal. The state of Connecticut cannot say in one breath that all children deserve an education and then in the next breath say that we should just homeschool or to practice or protect our faith. Our children have a right to an education and even after 22 hours of public testimony last year where thousands came to express their opposition, during the longest, I believe, the longest ever public hearing in Connecticut on record, or, or one of the longest, the authors of the bill the, and the committee still passed it out, ignoring their constituents. The great majority of us testified, 88%, I believe, were in opposition. And the many voices that are, have argued yesterday and this morning that these are uh, regressive pieces of legislation, which would end up harming Connecticut and Connecticut families. So I just have one question. Are you the members of the Public Health Committee willing to sign an affidavit to become financially responsible for my children if they are injured after being injected with the CDC's inexhaustible and ever-growing list of vaccines? Are you willing to sign that? Because what my husband and I realized when we did our research is that no one except for us as parents will take responsibility for our children if they become vaccine injured. And that this is what parents who are entrusted by God to care for their children do. We weigh out the pros and cons of our many decisions. And in the case of vaccines, after extensive research, my husband and I realized that the risk of vaccines for us and our children greatly outweighed the benefits. We take Mandy, responsibility. Mandy, you've reached your three minutes if you'd like to conclude. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so I just wanna make one last point that passing these bills will not make the number of vaccinated children in Connecticut increase. In fact, the unintended consequence of these bills is that the number of overall school children goes down. So it's predicted that as many as 15,000 children will leave Connecticut uh, if this bill passes and will also do unthinkable damage to school communities. Fewer teachers, fewer paraprofessionals, school personnel, uh, psychology, psychologically, the expelled children as well as their peers will suffer the damage of being ripped apart from their home and school. I know we don't have an emergency in our state. I'm but gonna, I'm going to have to stop you there because because we're over time. Okay, I, thank you're you. asking for a conclusion. Do you have a conclusion? You'd like thank to you. I do have a conclusion. Um, I would just love it if the committee were to ask me about being discriminated against the uh, against us at Yale New Haven, or ask me about the Yale medical doctors calling DCF on my husband because he failed to comply. Um, thank you so much to the committee and all of you for hearing us. I know that you must be very tired, um, but thank you so much for hearing our voices. Thank you, Representative Dauphiné. Hi, thank you, Senator, and thank you um, for your testimony. Can you expand a little bit on, you're saying that the you, you there was a report made on you by the Yale doctors? 
Exactly. So um, as many of us have uh, experienced in this, um, in this forum, we have been discriminated against. Um, we continue to be discriminated against for our religious beliefs. So uh, first we were kicked out of our former pediatrician's practice because we failed to comply with what, um, you know, the, the protocol was with the, the list of vaccines. And um, after that, my husband, who is a non-native speaker of English, um, actually took my daughter who had gotten a, a burn. It was the 4th of July. She actually uh, was a, you know, burned herself. Um, and he took her into the ER at Yale New Haven and was, um, harass everything was fine. They were treated, they treated her burn, no problem. And then at the very end of their conversation, um, the doctor who was treating said, oh, by the way, are you, is she up to date on all of her vaccines? Um, and he, you know, I wasn't with him. If, if I had, it would have been a very different story, um, being that, you know, I, ha I, I have white privilege, I know that, and I would not have taken um, the, um, the treatment that he was given there, but essentially um, they coerced him, they brought in a social worker, they tried to, they harassed him. Uh, my daughter, who was about six years old at the time, um, they didn't end up, he went in in the afternoon and they didn't end up letting him leave the emergency room until about 1 a.m. with my daughter. And um, we spent months actually um, with a social worker coming uh, to our house, uh, seeing that we are clearly a family who is not, um, you know, abusing their children. We're actually, you know, very, very concerned about their health. Our, our choices are different. Um, so I think that unless the authors of this bill can substantiate the claim that unvaccinated children put others in danger, then they have no business removing our constitutional rights. So um, I would just really urge the committee, there are many more pressing concerns right now, such as the impact of COVID-19, the restrictions, our economy, our freedom. Please do not spend any more of our time and taxpayer money to kick our children out of school over this non-issue. Thank you for explaining that and thank you for your testimony. Yes, thank you for your question. Thank you, Representative. I don't see any more questions or hands raised, so have a, have a wonderful day and thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you so much. Um, next, we're on, we have number 398, Jamie Daly, followed by 401, Stacy Joseph. Hello, can you hear me? I can, go ahead, Ms. Bailey. Okay. Hi, my name is Jamie Bailey. I am a Seymour resident and I strongly oppose House Bill 6423 and Senate Bill 568. When I had my daughter, I made a promise to myself and to God that I will protect my child at any and all costs. These bills hinder me from doing so. I want to quote a passage from the Declaration of Independence. Quote, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with, with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it end quote, meaning your power is derived from us, the people. You work for us. You are now holding our God-given right to a free public education hostage to get parents to comply. This is disgraceful to not only our state of Connecticut, but to our country as well. One day you will be before God and he is going to ask you why you used your power to deny people their right to live their lives through him. What will you say then? I can answer that for you. Nothing. And I feel sorry for those of you in approval, and I will pray for you. 
if these bills pass, you are kicking out tens of thousands of kids out of school, including my daughter who was on the spectrum for autism. How is this for the greater good? Have you really stopped and thought about the impact this will have on these families? The religious exemption has been around in Connecticut for 60 years with no issues. Why take it away now? My mother always used to tell me that there are always consequences to your actions. Do the ends really justify the means in this case? I will not co-parent with the government. I will not comply. My child will not comply. I will not comply. My child will not comply. I just, you know, I, I really, it's sad that we're at this point and I feel the grandfathering is a band-aid. Um, and, you know, my daughter's autism started after her six month vaccine schedule. So the science is not settled on the vaccines and autism. So I just, I really feel as a parent, you guys should be listening to us because at the end of the day, you guys work for us. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bailey. I don't see any hands. So um, thank you for being here this morning and for your testimony. Thank you so much. Have a good day. You too. Next is uh, 401 Stacy Joseph. I'm Stacy. And Stacey. following, oh, just one minute. Following that is 402 Eric Wilson. Go right ahead. I'm Stacy Joseph opposing HB 6423 and SB 568, for they will create a public health crisis, not prevent one. I wonder what it'll be like when all the religious kids get kicked out of school, all the Christians and Jews. I wonder if they'll add a chapter to the new racism curriculum saying how people of color aren't diseased like we used to think, but unvaccinated kids are. Not the unvaccinated adults, not the under-vaccinated legislatures, just the kids, specifically the Christians. Maybe we'll follow in the footsteps of New York where people were, will start shouting obscenities at homeschoolers as they walk down the street or refuse to let them into public places because discrimination is the new normal, right? I wonder what you'll tell your children or your grandchildren when they ask you why you had their friends kicked out of school. Will you tell them everyone's equal, dear, except those diseased Christians? I wonder what it's gonna be like when the school kids start getting sicker and sicker as the CDC and DPH pile on vaccine after experimental vaccine and you will have signed away their right to say no. I wonder if those children will even have babies of their own because none of these vaccines have been tested on fertility. Where did this whole vaccinated is better than unvaccinated story come from anyway? Especially since outbreaks occur in fully vaccinated populations and vaccinated kids can be asymptomatic carriers. I'm just wondering what are we basing that theory on? Um, could it be a marketing ploy by the industry that doesn't care about your health, but loves that your children are chronically ill? Could be. And on that topic, I need to address the elephant in the room. You will not protect immune compromised children by these bills. You will be creating immune compromised children by these bills and creating more seizure disorders, more cases of asthma, tics, autoimmune disorders, and neurological disorders because these chronic conditions are not present in the unvaccinated. That is what I've, I have found to be true in my family. That is what I have found to be true among my friends. That is what doctors who, not, who are not profit driven have found in their practices. That is just the reality of it, like it or not. I have heard legislatures on the public health committee detail their child's seizure disorder, autoimmune condition and fatal food allergy. I repeat, these conditions are not present in the unvaccinated. On the topic of God, you can see, you cannot see, if you cannot see that this is an antichrist agenda, then look harder. Witchcraft is real and, and, and demonic, but you have to know what it looks like. It's the media telling us what to be afraid of. It's science journals full of pharmaceutical ads. It's TV programs telling us that vaccines cured polio and no mention of DDT or lead arsenic. It's the slandering and censoring of pro-choice doctors. According to scripture, the first two commands are one, honor oh, God sorry, above. You hit your three minute mark if you wouldn't mind concluding your remarks. Yep. One, honor God above all things. And two, not to bow down to any idols. This debate is not about health. 
It's about idolatry of science and medicine and idolatry is prohibited by my religion. Thank you very much for your testimony, Ms. Joseph. I don't see any hands raised, so I hope you have a nice day. Thank you for being with us. Um, next, we have number 404, Leanne Zolnick, followed by number uh, 405, Sarah Olchanowski. Good morning. Good morning. Go right ahead. Thank you for being here. Thank you. My name is Leanne Zolnick, and I strongly oppose both bills HB 6423 and SB 568. If this bill is passed, my family and I will have no choice but to move out of the state. I will not allow the government to make any medical decisions for myself or for my children. You have no place in my home and no place to tell me how to raise my children. You did not birth them. I did. You do not protect them. I do. You do not feed, clothe, or wipe away their tears. I do. And it will always be me, not you. What some of you are proposing is downright disgusting, tyrannical, and in my opinion, spews dictatorship. This is America, and in America, we have rights and freedoms. Stop, stop trying to bully us and my children. Holding their education over their heads because of what the government says is for the greater good, when the greater good has never been in danger from unvaccinated children is disgraceful and quite frankly, embarrassing. I have two questions that I'm not asking hypothetically. I want answers. Question one, will any of you who are for these bills, will you lead by example? Will you roll up your sleeve, go into your doctor's office and record yourself to prove that the needle is actually being pulled from the actual vial of all recommended CDC guidelines of vaccination? Will you pump your system with all the vaccines within the next few months to get caught up like you are proposing all children do before the start of the next school year? Question two, will any of you sitting here today sign your name on a legal document stating that you will take full responsibility for the health of my children if I have any adverse reactions to any vaccine? I can probably answer that question for you, and the answer is no. You cannot, nor can any doctor or scientist put their name on that liability because everyone knows there is a liability. If you believe that it is so safe and to trust the science and to do it for the greater good, None of you should have any issue with saying yes. Yes, you will get the, all the recommended vaccines and yes, you will sign legal documentation to taking full responsibility. If your answer is no, then how would you feel if we the people impeached you from your seat of government? How would you feel if that was held over your head for not complying? I refuse to be the one held responsible for having to go against my beliefs and live with that burden because the state of Connecticut forced me to. It's never been up to you, and it should never be up to you to decide what is the best medical care for my family. This is America, and in America, in the state of Connecticut, going to public schools and having religious freedoms are our rights, not a privilege, and should stay that way. You all took an oath to protect our Constitution, not to rewrite it. Do your job, the job we the people hired you to do, and protect our Constitution and the citizens and children of the state of Connecticut and vote no to both of these bills. Thank you, and thank you for your time. Thank you for being here this morning. I don't see any questions, so um, have a wonderful day, and, and thank, thank you. you so much for your time. Um, next, we have number 405, Sarah Olchanowski, followed by number 406, Cynthia Kay. Hi, can you hear me okay? I can, go right ahead. Thank you, legislators. I've been praying for you and your families, and I hope you are all well. My name is Dr. Sarah Olchanowski, and I'm a Christian mother and doctor of audiology. I do not claim to be an epidemiologist, but I do hold multiple scientific degrees, and I was taught to analyze research. I've spent the last eight years since my first child was born reading books, peer-reviewed articles, listening to lectures, watching documentaries, and speaking with my physicians in depth about vaccines. I echo many of the testimonies you have already heard in opposition to these bills. The fact that our current vaccination rates in the state have shown that we are not in a state of emergency. The fact that there has never been an outbreak of preventable disease caused by religious exempt child in the state. The fact that many of these vaccines on the schedule are for personal protection only. Um, and the fact that most of this testimony has been in opposition to these bills. None of that seems to matter to many of you. I would point out that the vast majority of constituents heard do not support these bills and that you are all elected to represent these constituents and not to protect them from their beliefs. 
Speaking of beliefs, I have heard it stated that the religious exemption is being abused. As my testimony, I would like to offer one of the many valid reasons for our religious beliefs. It is heartbreaking. Um, oh, sorry. I, uh, my page didn't print out. Um, our, as Bible-believing Christians, um, we believe in Leviticus 11's um, mandate not to let unclean animals enter into our bodies. We believe that this is um, not only due to ingestion, but injection. Um, our family has enjoyed the blessings of God and health, and I don't believe this is an accident. I'm reminded of um, Daniel in the Old Testament when Daniel and his friends entered into Babylon. Um, they held true to their health beliefs instead of the Babylonian wisdom of the day, um, and they were blessed for it. They were 10 times healthier than, than their peers in Babylon, and I have seen this in my family as well. So it is heartbreaking to think that we may have to remove our children from their beloved school. My husband or I may have to quit our jobs in healthcare, or we may have to relocate out of the state. Those are our choices since we will not change our religious views based on secular laws. Please consider our family and the families of others with similar spiritual beliefs when you cast your vote in opposition to these legislative bills. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your testimony this morning. I appreciate you being here. I don't see any questions, so have a nice day. Thanks, you too. Um, next, we have Cynthia Kay, followed by uh, number 407, Susan Zabahansky. I'm sure I did not say that right. So Cynthia, go right ahead. Yeah, so I'm Cynthia Kanza. I thank you very much for all those who have been listening and participating all night long. It's been a long day. I oppose these bills in any form. I am a wife and a mother who knows that these bills are absolutely disgusting, malicious, thoroughly trampling on bodily autonomy and fundamental human rights of a person's right to choose what is best for themselves and their children. There is no such thing as my body, my choice, but that is not the slogan. You would be kicking my minority friends, kids out of school, daycare and in-state college too. So much for educating on racism. Aren't we advocating to keep minority communities in school? These are families who may only refuse one or all vaccinations due to their religious creed. You are also removing children based on inaccuracies of data last year. Now the data has been missing schools with 500 to 600 students. Percentages of pockets of children with no exemptions are just not up to date and the exemption rate went down. In fact, breakdown of newest data shows that seventh grade and higher hold the most exemptions. Isn't that what this bill is about? For the C Connecticut CPH, old data from 2018 to 2019 counted 7,800 exemptions. Department of Education has approximately 1,500 schools in Connecticut. That is an average of approximately five exemptions in each school. Each town is $75,000 to $100,000 lost per school base on average monies of $15,000 to $21,000 dollars per child or up to a hundred thousand dollars on special needs child a, a year in special education and support services. I'd like to know how the immunocompromised kids are going to be deemed medically exempt from these vaccinations and therefore still be in harm's way of all these unvaccinated kids. Questions to ask yourselves. What have you brought to the table in place of not kicking children out of schools to help the immunocompromised children? By removing children from schools, will it hurt schools and towns by losing funding? Removing children did not stop outbreaks in New York or California. Forcing by coercion is not freedom and holding education hostage through segregation and discrimination is not American. No one should be persuaded into homeschooling. Homeschooling is a choice. The citizens are the ones to decide what to do with their children. No government should be at the kitchen table with decisions for parents and children. Those of you who vote yes to these bills have no right to remove anyone's freedom of conscience to do what they feel is right. Is this regressive le legislation practicing separatism? I strongly oppose any legislation that would restrict parents' rights, isolate, show prejudice against school children, and future legislation that would infringe on the doctor-patient privilege. Please vote no or abstain. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I'm sorry I don't have your last name, Cynthia, so I don't mean to... I just call you by your first name, but I don't have your last name, so um, I don't see any questions. So thank you so much for being here this morning and for giving us your perspective. I appreciate your time. 
Um, next, we have Susan Zabachansky. You can you tell me how to really job. pronounce your name. You did a great job. That's it, <laughs> Zabachansky, yep. This one um, minute, this one minute, okay, Susan. Um, sure. Next, and after is 408, Lindsay Speed. Go right ahead. Um, I'm a pathobiology bio major from the University of Connecticut, and I thank all, um, all of you guys for being on all night. I've been on all day since nine o'clock yesterday. I stayed up all night to listen to testimony, and I appreciate what you have done as well. Um, I work in the field of veterinary medicine as a veterinary nurse for over 20 years. I currently own my own business. Um, I'd like to say to a constituent, uh, to a legislator in my area that I am not an anti-vaxxer, although I've been accused of being that. My daughter is um, vaccinated for all the vaccines that we felt necessary with our, within consult with our pediatrician, and she currently attends a private school. Um, I've I hope you guys all got our written testimonies because I don't see my name up on the, um, I don't see it posted and I did ask for it to be posted um, because I've changed my testimony since hearing 24 hours of testimony. Um, we've heard some doctors and nurses suggest that it's the duty of the public health committee to make uh, legislation that causes parents to abandon their religious beliefs or risk losing their child's ass access to personal education. Um, all this to purportedly protect an even smaller population's health, which potentially, while potentially risking their own child's health, no matter how small those risks are, um, based on science, um, we are to determine who, how are we to determine whose life is more valuable or sacred than another? So we're saying we're protect one population, but ignore vaccine injuries that have occurred. We can't deny that they've occurred, they've occurred. Um, We've even listened to a highly um, regarded doctor, Dr. Ross, say that this legislation will not likely solve the herd immunity issue as it would just push this approximately 2% out into the community where they could still spread as someone had asked him. He also mentioned there's no evidence of outbreak in Connecticut related to the population um, of these 2% and therefore uh, no reason to claim a public health interest for 2% of students that would substantiate them losing their constitutional constitutional rights to religion. Um, I, I agree from listening to all 24 hours of testimony today that there are deeply held beliefs on both sides um, that many do not want to let go of. Many on this committee are holding on to the belief that this 2% are posing a public health risk worthy of re removing a religious exemption despite the lack of evidence that this is true. The substantiated stigma surrounding unvaccinated children is being perpetuated to discriminate, segregate, and potentially totally isolate these children from their peers. Doctors, as part of their very job duties, treat people with deadly and potentially contagious diseases daily, yet are denying healthy children access to basic health care based on their inoculation status. Now you, our elected government legislators, want to deny them access to in-person public or private education based on their religious beliefs. These practices to me are simply un-American. I urge uh, you to can vote you no. you three minute mark if you wouldn't mind concluding your remarks? Sure, sure, I urge you to vote no to HB 6423 and SB 568. And I'm hoping that um, our testimonies are put up on the um, site. I haven't seen mine there yet. So thank, thank you for your time. Thank you for drawing our attention to that. Um, and. Thank you for being here this morning. I don't see any one's hand raised. So um, thank you so much for being here and sharing your perspective. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, next is number 408, Lindsay Steed, followed by number 409, Anita Hill. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Lindsay Steves. I'm an elementary school teacher and I'm also a youth staff pastor. Um, growing up, I was homeschooled, and um, it was a privilege that my parents were able to give me. I understand that many people do not have that same privilege, um, but I intend to give that same privilege to my son, and I always have, which is why I went to be an elementary school teacher. Um, growing up as a homeschooled child, I faced those stereotypes. Many of them are being thrown around in this meeting. Um, homeschooled kids are isolated. They are not socialized. Um, whatever so <laughs> other stereotypes you have heard, I've definitely been called them and um, been exposed to them as well as my son, I assume will be as well. Um, but the reason I'm mostly here today is for a more uh, sinister 
stereotype that is going to be applied to homeschool children, whether or whether they are not vaccinated. Um, and that is that they are a health risk to the community so much so that they cannot go to school. Um, I intend to vaccinate my son, but that is my choice. It is not the government's choice. Um, and he is going to have to carry around this stereotype because it's been rather made clear that um, your votes were decided before you came in here. And I'm sorry that is speaking out of turn, but um, that just seems to have been the case. Um, my mother-in-law is not able to speak here today, nor my father-in-law. They're both in the 1700s in terms of their ranking number. Um, but my mother-in-law is a chemist and a college professor who also opposes this bill. And my father-in-law is a pastor. And they both have an immunocompromised daughter. Um, she has drug-induced lupus, and she also opposes this bill. Um, their voices will not be heard today. And I'm going to actually end my time there um, because I do want other people to get a little bit of extra time because they won't. Um, but I do beg you to oppose these bills. Um, homeschool children have enough stereotypical um, names called them already. They do not need the sinister. Um, you are a health risk name of them as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Speed, for your testimony today. I don't see any hands raised, so I'm going to thank you so much for your time and have a good day. Um, next is 409 Anita Hill, followed by 410 Heather McKeon. <clears throat> Ms. Thank Hill, you. go right ahead. Can you hear me? I can and see you. Go right ahead. Great. Great. Dear members of the Public Health Committee, I'm here and deeply appreciate the opportunity to oppose Senate Bill 568 and House Bill 6423. I am a lifelong Californian from the Silicon Valley of Northern California who married an awesome person from Connecticut. As it stands, we are set to relocate to Connecticut shortly and have been doing business in the state for the past five years. We have purchased our house in Avon, found a private school we love, and are making our final plans to move to your beautiful state with our two girls aged nine and seven not only because we want our girls to understand the great history of the East Coast and the differences from the West Coast, but also because we want them to know their large family there. As background, both of my girls have experienced adverse events to vaccines. Both of them are at risk for future reactions acknowledged by our pediatrician, our beautiful pediatrician who is known and lectures around the world for being a forerunner in integrative and functional medicine has told us that even with functional support, of their metabolic system, they are both at risk for additional reactions. I've held my daughter in respiratory distress following DTAP, praying that she would pull through and would not wish this on any other person. Our pediatrician who unequivocally wrote us medical exemptions in the state of California acknowledged to her entire practice that because of laws passed in our state, laws just like the one we are discussing here today, the house bill, she could no longer risk her license as the state board was literally witch hunting all doctors who wrote any exemption that wasn't in lockstep with CDC guidelines. Many of my friends with school age children with current exemptions have either left the state for Idaho, Wyoming, Oregon, and Texas, or decided to homeschool until that no longer becomes an option and then they will move. So it's not an idle threat. We thought that a state calling itself the constitution state would be a haven for us. We understand that there are many doctors who practice functional medicine in Connecticut and would understand our inherited genetic, metabolic, and autoimmune concerns. Now we are not, now we are not so sure. If either of these bills pass, our family is considering selling our new house, which we haven't moved into yet, which will break many of our Connecticut's family's hearts as well as our own. But we cannot support paying taxes to a state that doesn't want to support our own well-being. These bills will have an economic effect beyond all the effects that were discussed over the last long 22 hours and will absolutely backfire. As a Californian, I can attest to that. I ask you, where will this end? How far will you cast those with differing beliefs away? What freedoms will you strip of us before you feel it is enough? My question is, if you're interested in creating a robust medical exemption, have you spoken with the medical doctors and physicians for informed consent to determine what those guidelines would be? And why are they not in the language of House Bill 6423? In California, physicians were guaranteed the right to write medical exemptions in support of functional medicine guidelines when our religious and philosophical exemptions were removed. Then legislature circled back and stripped them of this right, as I mentioned, witch hunting all doctors who wrote any medical exemption. Isn't it putting the cart before the horse if legislative guidelines can't be outlined before stripping all children using their- Can you hit your three minute mark if you wouldn't mind concluding? 
I'm all done. I strongly oppose, I strongly urge you to oppose SB 568 and House Bill 6423. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate you being here this morning. I don't see anyone raising their hand, so um, I wish you all the best. And uh, I don't know what the time is where you're at, so um, I hope you have one, a lovely morning. We're exploring Florida right now, so I'm in your time zone. Yeah. Okay, okay. I thought maybe you were very, very early this morning, but thank you. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't leave. Uh, Representative D'Amico has a question. Uh. Th thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry, sorry to jump in late. So, so, so Ms. Hill, how are you? Th thank you for coming to testify. Um, I, I, you know what, since you brought up the topic and we haven't really heard that much, I, I'd like to hear uh, something uh, I'd like to hear from you about uh, the guidelines that you think uh, should be uh, uh, incorporated um, uh, in into this legislation, guidelines with regards to medical exemptions, if you would. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm, I'm obviously not a pediatrician. I'm a registered dietitian and my, my specialist is functional medicine as it relates to um, nutrition. But um, I would be happy. I am sure that our pediatrician, if I asked her to give you succinct guidelines, would be happy to share those with you. And she could probably give you, you know, she has a practice, she vaccinates kids um, in her practice, and she can tell you you know, exactly what guidelines she would recommend. Okay. So I, that would probably, you know, do this body more good than me telling you. Okay. No, I, I'd appreciate that. If you get that to the committee, yeah, that, that would be great. And I assume that the state of California has guidelines or, or, or no. So when our philosophical exemptions were taken away, they said that functional medicine doctors could write exemptions um, as you had you know, indicated in a robust way based on family history, siblings with adverse reactions, um, autoimmune concerns in the family, et cetera, et cetera. So, so doctors were writing those exemptions as the legislature said that they could. Then when the medical exemption numbers went up to the, I guess, the dislike of the legislature, they circled back and said, you know, you have to like, doctors could only write five medical exemptions a year, and then they would be reviewed by a board. Um, and that the exemptions had to be in lockstep with like anaphylaxis or, um, you know, near death to a vaccine. So all of the functional medicine guidelines that, you know, like if your child has um, pans pandas and, you know, any immune assault to them triggers, ticks and neuro behavior disorders, um, that was no longer accepted. Like a doctor can't write a medical exemption for that with fear of, you know, risking losing their license in our state. So, um, you know, the legislature, in order to get the philosophical exemption and the religious exemption removed, promised one thing and then circled back and took that away. So it was, it's been a long, that was in 2015 that it started. So it's been a long seven years, six years. All right, Th thank you. I, I don't wanna take up any more time of the committee, but I appreciate that. And if you get me that information, get us that information, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. Um, I don't see any other hands raised. So um, thank you very much, Ms. Hill, for being here this morning. Um, next is number 410, Heather McKeon, followed by number 411, Victor Gorshkov. Hi, my name is Heather McKeon. I am coming to you today as a resident of Connecticut and a mother of five children to oppose SB 568 and HB 6423. My children have received most of the vaccines that are on the vaccination schedule. I have listened to our pediatrician regarding vaccines and we have given them the ones that we have decided to de that we have decided to and the ones that we have decided to decline based on our personal family's religious beliefs. This bill is a direct violation to the constitution. Our country was founded on our freedom to be able to live and practice our religions. And this bill would segregate, discriminate against and even penalize a minority group of individuals who may have a different belief than your own. We are currently homeschooling, which is our first year doing so. And while this bill may not affect my children at the moment, 
<clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm really nervous. <laughs> um, or even in the next couple of years, if we continue to homeschool, it would limit higher education they may wish to pursue. How is it okay to not allow young adults into college because of their religious beliefs? Why would it be okay to discriminate against my children if I decided to send them to public school once again? Section 20 of the Constitution of the State of Connecticut reads, no person shall be denied the equal protection of the law, nor be subjected to segregation or discrimination in the exercise or enjoyment of his civil or political rights because of religion, race, color, ancestry, or national origin. This bill directly goes against that. And for what reason? The rate of religious exemptions for new students enrolling in kindergarten has actually been declining, not increasing. Many legislators who voted for the religious exemption to be removed in New York have spoken out and said they regretted voting it forward. They didn't realize the impact it would have against taxpaying citizens and families. I ask you to deeply consider the negative impact this will have on families as well as being unconstitutional before voting to remove one of our religious freedoms in our beautiful state. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your testimony. You did a wonderful job. You had no reason to be nervous. Thank you. Um, you just see, no, no questions. So have a wonderful day and thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, next we have Rose Karakin. Karak yes, Rose thank you. Thank Hi, you, I go right ahead. Okay, my name is Rose Karakin. I'm a resident of West Hartford and I'm a grandmom who's raising her grandson. And I made a solemn promise to the Lord that if he had won custody of my grandson out of the terrible situation he was in, that I would raise him in prayer and according to his way. I oppose the following bills. HB 6423 is proposed removes the ability for a parent or guardian to literally change their mind. Section B, which is added, supersedes portions of Section A as underscored in the bill and grandfathered in are those who hadn't formally vaccinated their kids to continue the waiver. That's really not acceptable. Who here has never changed their mind? Although it's been represented the timing of these two bills has nothing to do with COVID, but rather vaccines in general, the timing of this high-speed pursuit to shut down choice is certainly concerning. Religion or not, this law that provides whatever the state thinks, but the people aren't allowed to think and possibly decide down the road to not vaccinate is seriously problematic. I oppose the Senate Bill 568 altogether as you want to remove any right whatsoever that a parent has outside of medical proof and medical reaction to this vaccine ingredients and upcoming vaccines ingredients, which we are really, really concerned over COVID because this is a rush job that doesn't go up the flagpole of a 10 year study and its possibilities. And it has, uh, it's, it's rooted in a messenger RNA, which I'm not a medical professional, but it's very concerning because this possibly can affect DNA. Although it was mentioned earlier that constitutionality of choice in other states was challenged in a handful of states that coerce vaccines upon the religious community doesn't change that this is taking away the freedom to choose, period. I sincerely hope that you take into consideration, because this is going to affect your families too. This is being forced on you as well. And to think of this that not only the safety and health and wellness of all the children of Connecticut, but also your children and your future generations, because the vaccines that are coming up are getting more concerning as we go along and they're not being tested out. So what we're gonna find in our future is that our children are the clinical study trials. This is very, very concerning. So please, I beg you, reconsider this bill don't lock us down because it's, it's legislative creep. It's going into communist control over us where like people were saying all through the night, we will have to flee. And if we have to uproot and go, it's gonna fracture families. It's going to really take a hit on the constitutional state that I have been here most of my life. My family emigrated here and made the choice to come to this state because of its greatness in history, as well as where it is and how it forms. Thank you for hearing me today. Thank you, Ms. Crockin. I, I wish you all the best with your grandson. Thank I you. don't see any hands. Oh, excuse me, Representative Pettit. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a quick uh, comment for those still watching. Uh, the science of the two new messenger RNA vaccines are such that the 
lipid exterior and the messenger RNA and the interior only get into the uh, cytoplasm of the cell and don't have the capability of reaching the nucleus. So there should be no theoretical nor practical way for them to interact with DNA. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for that clarification, Representative Pettit. I don't see any other hands raised, so have a wonderful day. And again, good luck with your grandson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, next we have, I, excuse me, I, I skipped 411, Victor Gorshkov. Uh, yes, can you Thank hear me you. all right? I, I can, and I apologize for skipping you before. Uh, that's all right. Uh, so we live in Wilton, um, over here in Connecticut. Um, I've got PhD in applied mathematics. Uh, both myself and my wife Svetlana, we oppose these two bills. Uh, personally, we've seen enough vaccine injuries and adverse effects among kids or folks that we know personally. So, of course, vaccines are generally good, and of course, they are not perfect. So, it's basically a game of, of chance. Uh, my wife and I, we are not anti-vaxxers, as they <laughs> call us these days. And of course, we do vaccinate our two daughters, uh, but uh, the choice of vaccines and the schedule is definitely between us and our doctor. And, and yes, it's pretty hard to find medical practice uh, which takes in kids with partial vaccination schedules. And yes, we've been pressured pretty hard during ER visits and in general, this is such a divisive topic, like totally toxic topic, which is virtually impossible to bring in in any you know social setting. I don't know how how our society got in here. You know, we grew up in the Soviet Union, came here 20 years ago. We never thought we would, you know, see a government effort to make you know such a uh, to make vaccines obligatory. So um, please vote no on both of these bills. Um, that's it from us. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, any questions? Seeing none, we're gonna try to squeeze in as many as we can between nine and nine o'clock. Next up is 414, Christian Riley followed by Kelly Petrignelli. Mr. Riley. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Please proceed. Okay. And you can see me now. Not really, but that's close enough. All right. Good morning. My name is Dr. Christian Riley. I'm a practicing chiropractor for nearly 20 years in the state of Connecticut. I'm what is known as a first generation principal chiropractor. My brother and I grew up in a medical household, both of my parents were registered nurses. As children, we were vaccinated. My brother has been a trauma surgeon for 20 years. As for me, instead of an allopathic health healthcare occupation, my deeply held philosophical and Christian beliefs, my personal life experiences, and my relationship with God led me towards a vitalistic profession. In hopes of offering unique perspective and perhaps new information to this committee, I'll attempt to share one of several reasons why I believe that we have so many chiropractors, including me, who are opposed to these bills. In the largest and preeminent chiropractic schools in the world, a vitalistic philosophy is taught. This philosophy continues to uniquely position principal chiropractors from mainstream medicine, a division that we are proud to uphold as we will not waver on principle. So what is principle? In 1895, in Davenport, Iowa, a man named Dee Palmer discovered a principle of nature, which has since been known as Palmer's law of life. Those of us principal chiropractors understand this law of life answers the question of where health comes from. The answer, above, down, inside, out meaning from God and through the spirit mind body connection. It is based upon the scientific concept of mental and neural impulse and simply put life energy flow. I attended Palmer College of Chiropractic and completed an accelerated five-year doctorate after I received my bachelor's of science with a major in biology. All this schooling and 20 years of experience in practicing in the field, most of which here in Connecticut have brought me to a much higher degree of certainty in this deeply held philosophical and religious belief. Having helped thousands upon thousands of people by practicing principal chiropractic, I've been brought to this moment where I listen to testimony from 9 a.m. yesterday to 2 a.m. last night when I fell asleep for the sake of my patients that I see today. I woke up at 6 a.m., started listening again, and I'm appalled that less than 25% of those that signed up to speak will have an opportunity to be heard. 
Not when so much is left to be said. Imagine telling people you have three minutes to fight for your lives, three minutes to fight for your families, three minutes to fight for your children, three minutes to fight for your God, three minutes to fight for your right to choose the health care of your choice, three minutes. Are you kidding me? And oh yeah, 75% of you will need to rely on others' testimony to get your message across because the committee rules simply do not have enough time for you. Let me try a different approach. There are too many misnomers. What is health? What is health care? In, in our society, health is a misnomer. We should call it sick care, not health care. We should call it sick and back to work insurance, not health insurance. Our education system is broken. Our healthcare delivery system is broken. Our financial system is broken. And evidently our legislative system is also broken. We need, we need to be able to define health. Health is a state of optimal mental, physical, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease and infirmity. It's a condition of wholeness in which all of our organs are functioning 100% all of the time. It's not this for that. It's not pills for ills. It's not potions and lotions. It's not creams and salves. We must define life, the innately intelligent power that animates the living world. And Palmer recognized, in fact, proved scientifically that life force could be interfered with by three main categories of stress, physical stress or trauma, emotional stress or negative thought, and finally, chemical stress you or toxins. Three minute mark, if you wouldn't mind concluding your remarks. Gladly. Chemical stress or toxins, many of which are found in vaccines. We believe that life flows from a clear, we believe that life comes from a clear flow of energy from above, down, inside out. I'm happy to answer any questions. God bless you all. I don't see any questions. Therefore, we'll move on to number 418, Megan Gilbert. Ms. Gilbert, please proceed. There you go. Hi. Hi, can you guys hear me okay? We certainly can, please proceed. Hi, my name is Megan Gilbert and I am in strong opposition of SB 568 and HB 6423. <sighs> I feel like this is such a complicated uh, issue and there's no simple answers. We we really need to work together as communities to address each and all the topics here and to really look at the bigger picture. Thus, I feel the first thing that should be done is to break down this complex problem into parts and to address each one of these parts individually and then wholly where there are potential problems. Where I stand, I do not believe that removing the religious exemption is going to solve any of the vaccine issues, but only make the situation even worse and more complex pulling these kids from their schools, their lives, their friends, will only put unnecessary emotional and psychological financial burdens on them and their families. I strongly believe that we need to preserve and protect our individual rights to choose what we put into ours and our children's bodies, as well as to protect the First Amendment. And before we go to the extreme of removing the religious exemption, we should first exhaust all other options. One huge topic that I believe that we need to focus on is education. We need to be educating kids, their parents, and the communities. And this is just a number I've heard. If something close to 40% of children in some communities are unvaccinated in some areas in Connecticut, we don't know why. Not only is this a huge problem versus the very small percentage of the population that claims religious exemption, but it also shows a huge problem with the lack of equal education and focus on education should therefore, I feel, be a major priority. Another area that deserves a lot of attention is research. There are so many related aspects that need to be considered when discussing immunity, such as how it relates to and is impacted by nutrition and diet, um, epigenetic, genetic makeup, and hereditary factors in general, and so much more. And I think we need to be working on synthesizing safer vaccines. We need to find out whether or not and how people are having reactions, whether it be to the vaccine itself, its mechanism or the constituent parts within the vaccines. Um, there are so many gray areas here and questions where we don't really have all the research, the statistics or the science to back up. Therefore, in many cases, people start making assumptions out of fear and their individual experiences, which is understandable, but they begin to push their personal agendas without really having the science to back them up. So. I believe that an important part is that we need to do all the research and the problem solving first before we can really answer some of these questions and before we can truly debate the issue. 
in an accurate manner. And once we've done all the research and we know exactly what the science is telling us and everyone has been educated properly and has all the information in front of them, only then can we really begin to weigh which issues are more pressing and have more weight. And only then can we have an intelligent and scientifically backed up discussion about vaccines, their risks, um, what they pose versus the benefits and how all the related and interwoven topics also take precedence. Only then can we start to solve this very complicated issue and to start to work on all you the individual three minute mark if you wouldn't mind. The top. Sure. In summary, um, I feel that things we need to focus on and improve our education about vaccines, nutrition, improving immunity through research and on surrounding all aspects of the topic and related topics such as mental health, creating safer vaccines, protecting our individual rights, building stronger communities and working together on our common goals of protecting our children, creating a safe and healthy world for everyone to thrive in. We're all treated with fairness and equality and there's no discrimination or segregation of any kind. I do have a bachelor's degree in chemistry from UConn and minor in molecular and cell biology and I've taken many upper level PhD classes in chemistry and I've taught at the university level um, as a TA. So I think of myself as a humanist though. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you. I do not see any questions. Aww. In which case we will move on to number 419, Christopher Ross, followed Thank by Monica Fiore. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. Hey, Mr. Ross, uh, you oppose? I oppose the bill HB 6423 and the SB 568. And I'd like to give the balance of my time to my wife. That's actually the decision maker for our family. <laughs> so. Hi, my name is Jacqueline Ross. Um, we live in Northeast Connecticut. We have always lived here. Our entire families are here. We went to local high school tech school and started our careers and built a home here. Um, it's unfortunate that we're still dealing with this. Um, we had our first child in 2015 and I wish back then I knew what I do now. I didn't know that people were fighting to keep the religious exemption back then. In fact, I didn't even know exemptions were a thing before I had kids. Um, I feel like it's honestly kind of crazy that you need permission to um, figure what you need, what you can do with your family as far as um, medical procedures go. Um, what children are causing a public health crisis right now? There's none. We're not having outbreaks of measles, mumps, anything like that at all. Um, even last year with the 22 hours of testimony that was admittedly flawed data, this still passed through to the house, which I think is unacceptable. Um, in my opinion, with how many people were in opposition. Um, the people, for the people of Connecticut, look how many people are here right now. Um, this will backfire if it passes. Parents will not compromise their convictions. They'll figure it out. And it's going to cost the state enormous amounts of money and expul expulsion hearings and lawsuits. People will figure it out. They'll either homeschool, like we plan on doing, if this passes, or leaving the state, which is unfortunate, but we had amazing childhoods going to public schools and participating in sports and scouts and things to that nature. And the fact that our kids won't have that same opportunity is really saddening. Um, and this is in my view, very stereotypical. How many people have jumped on here and said, I'm not anti-vax, but the fact that, that if someone just opposes one single vaccination, they're considered anti-vax. And this is just going to discriminate our children even more. And like someone had mentioned before, if they're homeschooled, whether they're vaccinated or not, people are gonna make the assumption that they are some kind of disease carriers, which is in fact, not true. We don't have data to support that any kind of illnesses are coming from unvaccinated or not fully vaccinated children in the school communities. Um, so I hope that you guys do hear everyone speaking out and listen to the parents because Honestly, last year we wrote some awesome testimonies. We had great data bringing to you and I was pissed and I'm pissed this year that this is still, it feels like we're not being heard and that this is about politics. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, seeing no questions, we're gonna move on to number 420, Monica Calafiore, followed by Mark Ferris.
Apparently, she's not in the waiting room. Uh, we're going to move on to 423. Uh, Mary D'Amato, welcome. Hi, thank you so much. My name is Mary D'Amato, and I oppose bills HB 6423 and SB 568. My husband and I have three school age children. I have a 12th, 8th, and 2nd grader who prior to COVID excelled in school socially and academically. However, since the start of remote learning, my children's grades and education has suffered significantly. Under the current language of the bill, my 12th grader would be allowed to graduate high school and attend college in the state of Connecticut. My eighth grader would be allowed to finish high school and play sports, but then would not be allowed to attend college in Connecticut, which would not afford us any in-state tuition benefits. And my second grader would immediately be considered a public health threat and would be banned from attending public school and participating in sports in this state. I am aware that you offer homeschooling as a solution for the parents who choose not to vaccinate due to their religious beliefs. However, homeschooling would not be an option for my family. My husband and I both work full time outside of the home and we cannot afford to become a single family income. Also worth mentioning, I don't have a teaching degree. I don't have any formal training on elementary curriculum and I have no idea how to, how to begin. Have you considered the devastating effects that this would have on the mental health of our children? Recently, I spoke to a psychologist at CCMC that has said they have been inundated with adolescent mental health emergencies and she anticipates that it's only going to get worse. If this bill passes, we are ensuring a new public health crisis. Together, my husband and I own three businesses and we employ 21 employees. We believe in vaccines, we believe in science and medical breakthroughs, but we also feel strongly that me medical decisions should be left between a patient and his or her doctor. No one should be forced or coerced into any medical procedure ever. If this bill passes, my kids and I will be forced to leave the state and it will divide my family. If this bill passes, my husband will have to remain in Connecticut for an extended transition period. He is a board certified physician licensed by the state of Connecticut and will be forced to start a practice in our new home state. And as that practice grows, he will begin to close his Connecticut practice until he is able to tr transition to our new home completely. My two youngest children would be forced to complete their schooling in a different state. We'll be paying taxes and spending our money elsewhere. Sure, the town and state won't suffer greatly when our family leaves and our business closes. However, there are many other families who own businesses that have the same plan. Our staff of 21 plus the countless staff of these other businesses will be left without gainful employment. Families will be divided, employees left jobless. How many residents will leave, families torn apart, and businesses will close before Connecticut lawmakers realize they have made a mistake? We saw it happen in New York when there was a mass exodus in 2019. And I ask you, why is only one of my healthy children considered a threat to the public? How should I explain to my eight-year-old that her older brothers can go to school and be with their friends and the teachers they love, but she cannot? What about the unvaccinated teachers, faculty, staff, parent volunteers? I regularly volunteer in my children's school. How does it make any sense that I would be allowed to go into the school to continue to volunteer, but that my daughter would be the only family member of mine that is not allowed? Is there an age limit to the spread of disease? My family has called Connecticut home since my family immigrated from Italy in the early 1900s. I'm my sorry. My children and I uh, will not just be leaving my husband. You've had your three minutes. If you could please conclude. I, yes, I ask that you dig deeply and truly consider how this bill will affect so many of the state's children and their families. Please vote no. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no questions, we'll move on to number 430, Carol Carson. Now they're on 430. Hello, I'm 422. I'm 422. We were told you were not there. Uh, please proceed, uh, Ms. Ewers. Um, my name is Lisa Olson. I'm using Rachel's phone because... Well, that's very um, confusing. You can understand what okay. we had a problem because... Yes, she, she changed it on there. Sorry. I'm opposed to both bills. I'm a pastor's daughter, a pastor's wife, and a youth pastor living in Thomaston, Connecticut. Imagine my joy when at the birth of my granddaughter, my daughter's pediatrician walked in to give her her first welcome to the world thing. And he assured us that we were welcome at his practice that because my daughter, though fully vaccinated, did not believe um, for from her faith that um, her children would be vaccinated. We were therefore, because his office was bought out by a conglomerate, he um, retired and we were kicked out of that, um, that 
office. We found another one and an adorable, wonderful pediatrician whom we love. My daughter was fearful saying, don't retire like our other one did. Please stay because you're one of the only ones we could find. And he is an adorable man um, of the Jewish faith. And he said, we live in the great state of Connecticut, the constitution state. They will never take away our rights for our religious freedom. Do not worry. And here we are. I have four generations of um, brilliant uh, family members. My dad, who's 81, just moved here from New Hampshire to be close to his great grandchildren. And our family has four generations living from Cromwell to Stanford and Thomaston to Canton. We're business owners, we're CPAs, we're therapists, we are teachers. And um, we will not allow our children um, because of our faith to be vaccinated. And therefore there will be a big brain drain leaving Connecticut. Uh, we're all homeowners, we're all, we all pay a lot of taxes. And I am so fearful for our grandchildren that they will have to leave. Um, we'll all be scattered, a diaspora of um, believers in Christ who aren't, um, will not stand for this and we will not vaccinate our children. But the state of Connecticut will be losing amazing people. Um, thank you for your time. And please, 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 please don't make us all leave this state. Thank you. Seeing no questions, number 430, Carol Carlson. Please proceed, Ms. Carlson. We're trying to squeeze in a couple more before we're done here. I'm sorry, Ms. Carlson, you're really uh, not coming through very clearly. Can you do anything to improve that? I can go upstairs. Give me one second. I'll run. Any better? Much better. Thank you. All right, I oppose these two bills as I have feel they, they remove the last means for Connecticut residents to retain their inherent in, individual right to choose for themselves and their children. I'm not against vaccines as a whole, but in this instance, this vaccine is very different. This RNA based vaccine, I don't feel there's enough testing and study done. And if it has been, I don't feel the information is available for everybody to make a good ballot decision. I'm going to interrupt you just for one moment, just to clarify for your benefit that the COVID vaccine is not part of this bill, but please continue. Okay. Uh, I came from the Roe versus Wade generation. We fought for our right to choose. Came from the Vietnam generation, the school busting desegregation generation, thalidomide babies, and Monsanto. I've witnessed the rise and influence of big pharma, and have felt the influence in the medical field and the food industry. I've worked with insurance companies for 20 years. I'm very discouraged by their arrogant and false facts and lobbying for their profits. The regulation should be, there should be more regulation in these industries. As far as the pediatrician issues, they are real. My son was born in 1978. Since the age of two, he has fought severe chronic asthma and other health issues. And the other regulations, as far as I'm also an Oxycontin victim because it was introduced to my husband in 99 as a non-addictive painkiller. I lost him in 2019. I've lost faith in science and modern medicine. I'm currently hanging on to my last threads of faith in government and especially the FDA. Antibiotics are overused. There are natural remedies. How come they're buried? Nutrition is so poor, no wonder people have compromised immune systems. Lastly, there can be no board to decide if one's religion is valid enough to earn an exemption. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Ms. Carlson. Uh, we're gonna move on next to Julian Bett and then we're gonna do what I promised 23 hours ago to ele elected officials uh, speak at the very end, Representative Case will probably be the last word today, but please proceed, uh, Ms. Bett. Hello, my name is Julian Betty, and I'm here to oppose HB 568 and SB 6423, 
I'm a high honor student in my freshman year of high school. I enjoy basketball. I played freshman soccer this year, and I presently dive for the pop rock team. I also have been playing piano since I was five years old. I enjoy my friends and learning about new things every day at school. My favorite subject areas are math and honor Spanish. I'm here today because there is no reason for the state of Connecticut to remove me from school. It is my constitutional right to a public education. I should be entering 10th grade next year, which is where my teachers will guide me to my rightful future that I choose. Without an education, it will be difficult for me to achieve my dreams. I hope that you consider these laws, how these laws will impact my life, discriminate me from my friends and have my future put on hold. Please consider how this will affect my family and me. Take me taking away my right to a public education is unconstitutional and fair and unfair. Please vote no on these bills in all forms. Thank you for your time and allowing me to speak. Hi, my name is John Betty. I am six years old and I want to stay in school so I can see my teacher and my friends. I just started gymnastics and I also have been playing piano for two years. I love to read and write every day. My dream is to be a famous ballerina. If she passed this bill, I would have to take these sh shots that I never took before, and that makes me scared. I am a healthy girl, and my mom and dad keep me healthy on their own way. That is our choice. Thank you. My name is Jai Betty, and I oppose HB 568 and SB 6423. I want to stay in school for the following reasons. I like playing football with my friends in school when we are all, at re all there at recess. I also love my computer class, and I'm learning Spanish, too. For a career, I want to be an actor and a YouTuber inspiring children around the world. My life goal is to donate at least $10 million to charity. If these bills pass, then there is a lower chance for me to accomplish my life goals. I'm a sixth grader now. And my parents told me about the new rule for sixth graders and below. will not be able to go back to school if, this bill, if these bills pass. This is very unfair to my little sisters and me. I was also looking forward to meeting my soulmate and having four kids and getting married to in the future. But all of this gets majorly slowed down from these bills. Please think of kids like me when you were voting. Thank you for your time. Thank you all for your testimony. I really do hope you meet your soulmate regardless of the outcome of this legislation. Uh, wonderful job, uh, all of you. And thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Well, we're down Thank to the you. very last uh, minutes here. I understand Rep Case cannot join us. So we're gonna end with Cynthia Crockett uh, Croshaw. Please, Ms. Crockett Croshaw, you get the last word today. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to let you know that I oppose House Bill 6423 and Senate Bill 568. Um, you know, I feel that this is an issue of respect and you ought to treat other people how you would want to be treated. And I feel like if this bill were passed that it would show a complete lack of respect, disregard and outright trampling of other people's religious beliefs and right to an equal education. I believe that it was out of respect that 60 years ago during a polio outbreak when Connecticut instituted the vaccination laws that it established a religious exemption the data in current time shows that the religious exemption is consistently low year after year. The overwhelming majority of school children in Connecticut are vaccinated, 96 to 97%. The law has been a great success over the past 60 years, and we know that because there have not been any significant outbreaks in Connecticut due to the lack of vaccinations. Thus, it is apparent that these bills are not really about vaccinations, but about eliminating religious freedom from our society. Our founding fathers uh, fled religious persecution in their countries and established this country as a place where people could be free to practice their religion. The First Amendment prohibits any law which impedes the free exercise of religion and the 14th Amendment prohibits discrimination on that basis. Connecticut law likewise provides that the government shall not burden a person's exercise of religion and cannot be discriminated. This country gives asylum to thousands of people a year.
and Connecticut is home to several sanctuary cities. As such, Connecticut has significant numbers of people who came to this country and Connecticut seeking religious freedom. They did not lightly leave their countries, their family, their friends to come to a strange land only to be discriminated against in restricting their religion. Um, coming to a place where they're not going to get education for their children if they don't accede to the government's demands. People have come to the land of the free to be free. They have not risked their lives and lost everything for a country that is disingenuous and merely gives lip service to religious freedom. These bills attempt to withhold public education contrary to the 14th Amendment. If passed, this will create a population of children who are not equally educated and socialized. This will disproportionately impact lower and middle class families because they don't have the money and the resources to educate in the same way. Furthermore, there, if there is a contingent of children that are not going to school, they will not be equally socialized. We know from the past year of remote learning and the record suicide and depression oh, rates, sorry, the me, devastating you effect. You hit, you hit your three minute mark if you wouldn't mind concluding. I'm sorry? You hit your three minute mark if you wouldn't mind concluding your remark. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Well, I would conclude saying that as the court rightly said in Brown versus the Board of Education, that separate is not equal and has no place in our society. And I hope that we've learned from history how toxic separate is. And I think that one of the greatest problems in our society is lack of respect for one another. And I hope that this legislature is above of that. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. And I think uh, ending on a tone of respect is exactly where we ought to be. Before we adjourn this hearing, a few things I'd like to say. First of all, uh, we acknowledge that there are a lot of people out there that would have wished to have been able to present their point of view to this committee over the last 24 hours. And I will reiterate for the umpteenth time that we I want to hear from you and we encourage you to submit written testimony. We're going to give ourselves uh, the better part of a week to, to uh, go through that testimony so that everybody's voice can be heard in one fashion or another. So please do so. Secondly, I would be remiss if I did not thank profusely our crack staff that has been with us every step for the last 24 hours. Our administrator, Beverly Henry, um, Lindsay Van Buren, uh, Cass Fruin, David Ratcliffe, and Alexandra um, Doratinsky. Uh, we could not have done this without you. And in fact, uh, you did much of the work and we just basically wrote on your coattails. And lastly, I wanna thank uh, all the members of the committee who, who, uh, who persevered for this 24 hours and all those who watched us. Uh, we have tried to honor a good process and to uh, listen to the people of the state of Connecticut. And we assure you that uh, we will have a vigorous debate on the merits of this bill when we contemplate passing it out of committee uh, in, in the near future. So I wanna thank you all for your participation. Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, uh, Representative Zup, uh, uh, excuse me, that must be the administrator, uh, Ms. Henry. Zupkis would like to say something. I see, now uh, Representative Zupkis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be brief. I just wanted to um, say to the people out there, the almost 1,700 people that were not heard, um, that I personally don't believe there's anyone on this committee that can read 1,700 pieces of, legis of testimony. Um, and I am sad to say that I don't believe all of their voices will be heard, whether they oppose this bill or support it. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there to the people um, of Connecticut that did not get a chance to voice their opinions because I know I can't read that many pieces of testimony and I'm not sure that anyone on this committee can. Thank you. Well, I'll just say representative, I like a good challenge. And if it comes to reading what people of the state of Connecticut have to say, I think that's a, a worthy endeavor. And if there's not further objection, we will, uh, uh, Call the meeting, the public hearing, the public health committee adjourned. Thank you all.